float fishing. I think it's how we all imagine fishing to be. There's nothing finer than watching that little red tip bob up and down and hopefully the anticipation of catching a few fish. It's a great way to plodge a fish and that's exactly what I'm going to do today. A few maggots and a few of these, let's see what we can catch. So you're joining me at Sherwood Forest Fishery, just outside Mansfield in North Nottinghamshire, Robin Hood country. It's a beautiful backdrop, there's a road, serves all the lakes all the way along and I'm assured they're absolutely full of fish and I can't wait to get started for a fantastic day's float fishing. So what do you need to go float fishing? And it's quite simple today, there's not a lot of wind, I've got a 13 foot rod and I'm going to fish a waggler and all I've picked is a nice intake waggler and I'm going to go through the details of all the shotting pattern, how I set it up, my hook lens etc later on so if you want to know the finer details after we've done our fishing just come to the video at the end and we'll talk you through it all. So I'm going to plumb the depth and on a waggler I think the simplest way to do that is just to squeeze a split shot onto the hook so I've put a triple A shot which is heavy enough to sink the float but not too heavy so that when I'm casting it it interferes with uh, the flight of the waggler because that's all about the balance of the weight so of course we've got a two and a half gram waggler on which is what I've started on and the triple A shot when you're casting it will create like a pendulum so you don't want it too heavy like a plummet because you won't be able to cast it and you'll finish up getting a bit of a mess so a nice light shot and I've just cast my waggler to where I think I'm going to be fishing and if the float sinks because the triple A is overloading the float then I know that I'm not deep enough if the float sticks out the water and I can see that I can see the tip of the float so I'm just gonna wind it back a little bit and I'll just adjust the depth that I'm set at but when you when you're fishing your float it's not just from the bottom to the shot if you tip your float up so it's from there right up to the float tip because of course that sits up like that and lengthens your rig so I'm just going to pull it down a bit further and it might be that all of a sudden the float that I thought I might be using is a little big because there's not a lot of wind today so I don't need a float to beat the wind and I don't have to cast too far and that is surprisingly shallow I'm just going to cast it a bit further yeah so that's that's sunk the float and that tells me that where we're fishing there, I'm just going to cast a little bit further. It's deeper than what, I, what I've got it set at. Yeah, that's pulling the float under. So back up a little bit and that'll give us what we need. Nice gentle cast. I'm not trying to throw it too hard. And there you go. Look, I've pulled that float up by four inches and the float, I can see the tip of the float, which means now that that shot that I clipped on is sat on the bottom and it's not pulling the float under. So we know that the depth is somewhere, I've got it within four inches. Now, I've not gone for the accuracy that some people talk about because we're on waggler. And ordinarily on the waggler, I'll fish over depth anyway. And the reason for that being you get a little bit of tow and it's a nice light shotting pattern and it just gives the bait some stability. So for me, that's close enough. We know exactly where that is and we'll mark that on the rod and I'll show you how to do that just in a second. Just to mark the depth on my rod so I know where I am and that'll help me if I need to re-rig or uh, reset my depth if I come off the bottom and I want to move it. So I've just put my hook on the little line clip which just sits above your reel fitting and I've folded the waggler back. And basically the reason for that is because that gives me an indication of the depth. So we know that the depth is somewhere between the tip of the float there and four inches underneath, which happens to be on the eye. You don't have to mark your rod, but I like to, because sometimes my brain gets distracted and I need to know where I am. And it's just where that is there. I've just marked it off onto the rod like so. And that gives us our depth. Now, I talked about float choice. I think I'm actually going to reduce the size of that float so that it's not too heavy so I can hit more bites. But we'll go into detail with that 
in a short while. So we've got his rig and we've plumbed up, we've got the depth and there's only one thing left to do which is get fish in. So I'm just going to hook a single maggot because we lose feeding single maggots. So why not match the hatch as they say but we're going to fish on the hook with the same bait as we're feeding and we'll start to fish. So what you'll have noticed there is that I've cast further than where my bait's going to land. And the reason for that is because when you're float fishing, it's all about controlling your float. And what I mean by that is that you need to make sure that your float is actually doing all the work and it's not being affected by outside influences like wind and tow. And what I mean by tow is movement of the water. So by casting further than... Oh, I told you it was full of fish, this place. Uh, by casting further... Uh, then I'm actually fishing or where my bait's landing what that's actually doing is allowing me to wind the float back and sink the line we'll just swing him in that's a little skimmer beautiful fish nice little skimmer bream um, so as I was saying and I'll, and I'll demonstrate that just again that when you cast in to control your float and give you the best possible chances of fishing correctly and presenting your bait correctly we have to get the line under the water so float choice is massive because we need to make sure the float will cast fair enough and I've just cast further and you'll see that I've quickly with my float my rod tip under the water I've retrieved the float back and what that's actually done is broke the surface tension of the water and the line is now underneath and the line is sinking so it's subsurface and that means it's not going to be affected by the wind because if your line is on the top the wind will pick up the line and it'll start to pull it in a big bow and it'll start to move your float and unfortunately fish aren't daft you're loose feeding maggots and they're sinking vertically like this and what's going to happen is your hook with the maggot on is going to be dragged along by the wind and it's going to be skitting through the middle of their dinner plate and trust me if you had a chip that were moving across your dinner plate on your dinner table you certainly think there was something wrong with it and you wouldn't pick it up so you're trying to create the same presentation with your hook uh, maggot as you are when you're firing in these loose fed maggots like so because they're just going to go nice and down and you can see that that floor is actually static and with the, the hook has fallen through the water nice and steadily in a similar fashion to the ones that we lose feeding and it's now laid on the bottom stationary very very important to make sure that when you're fishing your float's not getting dragged along the lake with this gentle breeze because that will stop you catching fish dead simple so straight away we've caught a few fish and it's just reminding me the absolute pleasure I get from watching to see a float go under. Now, feeder fishing is really popular these days and I don't know if that's because it's easy or it's good for big weights or it wins matches or it catches bigger fish. But I'm going to ask you, what do you think? Is there any more pleasurable thing than watching a float go under or are you feeder or pole? What are you? I'm going back to my waggler fishing because I love it. So the only break we've brought today is maggots. I brought a couple of pints of maggots, a dead simple, fundamental bait that every single fish loves. So if you want to learn how to waggle a fish, or you're just starting out, there's no better bait than maggots. And the reason is that everything eats it. And that means that you'll probably encourage the fact that you're going to get bites. The more bites you get, the more you'll learn. Fishing is a learning curve. So you can't learn anything unless you're catching fish. So stack the odds in your favour and use a bait that you're guaranteed to get bites on, I can guarantee you, you'll learn more. And that's another bite. Now, despite that the weather's freezing, I'm like everywhere at the moment. There's been a lot of rain and the water's coloured. These fish are still managing to find the bait and that's a bottom feeder. So we know that the maggots are getting down there because little skimmers like that, they live on the bottom, or near the bottom, should I say. Let's not stereotype them. 
unlike roach and rudd and hide that seem to prefer to swim up in the water, but by loose feeding maggots, it, especially in a shallow um, venue like this, you are actually feeding all the levels, which means you're attracting all the different species of fish, which is a beauty of fishing in this style. So once again, out a little bit further, rod tip under the water, retrieve the line, back to the fishing position. You can always adjust that. I'm just going to bring that back another turn because it's not quite far enough. And that's just drawn me uh, waggler and my rig back into the area for feeding because when you're feeding you kind of get a bit of a um, sort of central point yeah maggots are scattering everywhere because that's the nature of loose feeding maggots but there'll be a hub there'll be a central point where most of your maggots are concentrated so just try and put your float in the middle of that ordinarily that's where most of the fish will be because you've you're concentrating most of your feed there. There is a conversation to have around fishing around the circumference of your peg because sometimes you'll find that when you're catching a lot of fish, you get a lot of disturbance in your swim. You hook a fish and the fish is sort of, you know, swimming around, fighting back a little bit. It might just disperse your fish a bit. So don't be frightened of fishing around the peripheral edges of that sort of central hub. So if you imagine it like a target board, you've got your bullseye, which is right in the middle, but that ring around, right around the edge, there'll be fish sat back. Sometimes the bigger fish, sometimes the different species of fish. If you've got a little bit of underwater tow, oh, that's one there, that's a smaller fish. And that's probably the quickest bite we've had, that not been in two, two seconds. Yeah, roach. That kind of proves what we're just saying about different fish feeding at different levels. I mean, for all we know, that could have took that maggot on the way down. And because it's only a small fish, it might not have registered. So the chances are a roach, midwater roach, just intercepting the bait as it falls, which is why it's important, if you can, to always fish as lightly shotted as you can to allow the bait to pass through the levels to give yourself an increased chance of all the different species. So we've caught a few fish, we're getting a few bites. I've had a chub and a couple of skimmers and I've just had three or four small roach, great sport. But I've just noticed uh, myself that when I'm casting, the, the, the actual, the wind's got up a little bit. So I just wanted to, at this point, just remind everybody that so easy for, for me to sit here and adjust uh, without mentioning it. And I think little things like this will help you to catch more fish that the little breeze from left to right is coming across the lake. So when I'm firing my maggots in, I'm getting a little bit of a drift. And when I'm casting my float, it naturally wants to go windward and that catches the line. And therefore when I'm drawing it back, I'm, I'm not fishing in the same spot. Now, I'm not saying you've got to be pinpoint accurate, but it does help to catch more fish if you can keep, as I remember me talking about that target area, if you can try and keep that and keep as close to the center as you can. So just be aware that when you're fishing to keep your eye on that you're not drifting. And the best way and simplest way to do that, and I've done it naturally because that's, obviously I fish quite a lot, um, is you need to pick a far bank marker. And in my case, there's a little dark spot on the far bank there, there's a few uh, dead, dead reeds and just to write them is a little dark hole on the bank and I'm using that as my the centre of my bullseye I've lined the bullseye up with the, with that dark spot and just remember to pick a spot because 
what can happen is you drift and you drift a little bit more, a little bit more, and you'll finish up two hours later fishing miles away from where you started. And that just, that doesn't help you to catch fish. So to improve your chances of catching fish, make sure that you keep your eye on where you're fishing. Don't let outside influences like wind, you know, because we talked about earlier sinking your line, making sure you've got it right. And as the wind got up a little bit, I found myself casting a little bit further even still to make sure that I can straighten my line out and pull that float right back into the centre of the bullseye. So little things like that, which, you know, some people might think are obvious. If you're an experienced fisherman, um, you do that as second nature because you've been fishing a long time. But if you're new to this or you're new to float fishing, then that's probably a great little way of um, using simple things like far bank markers and keeping your eye on where you're drifting your maggots to just to help you to catch a few more fish. So that wind has picked up a little bit and we're actually getting a little bit of tow, what I call tow, and it's quite commonly known as tow, which is the wind is moving left to right, up, up the lake if you like, and in a shallow lake like that, what that actually does is it moves the top surface and creates the bottom of the lake to, so it turns the water over, it rotates it. And that makes the lake start to move in the opposite direction to the wind. That can be fantastic for fishing because it kind of puts a bit of movement into the water, makes the fish sit up, and they feed quite well in them circumstances. Now, that's all well and good, and that brings me on to a perfect um, reason why, when I talked about line earlier and I said I've got a three pound line on, when you're waggler fishing, or any kind of float fishing, it's important to choose your tackle accordingly. Now we're fishing a light float and we're using it in shallow water and that means that we have to choose our, our line choice is, is really important. Very common these days because of all the carp in, in all these lakes to use really thick line because you think you need to get, you know, drag these fish in and you're gonna get broke and all the rest of it. But we're not fishing like that today. We're fishing single maggot, small hooks, and we're catching, you know, manageable fish. We're not getting dragged around with carp. And even if we were, because we're using a, a waggler rod, which is quite forgiving, um, and it's winter as well, we won't get, you know, so the frantic fight that you can imagine you'd get in the summertime. So this three pound line that I'm using um, is perfect because it cuts through the water and therefore doesn't pick up the toe quite as much as what a thicker line would. It's easier to sink because it breaks the surface better. So choose your real lines according to what you're trying to do. Yeah, if I was to use a six pound line, that would mean that I'd have to use a heavier float to basically pull the line off the reel. So I'd have to put a lot more effort in or add this massive float because the line would create drag. And it's not just drag when you're casting, it's drag when you're trying to sink the line, and it's also drag with the toe and the wind. So just think about what you're trying to do and stack the odds in your favour to make life a little bit easier for you. So if you come in and you're fishing single maggot with a nice light hook and you start for a day's pleasure fishing, catching, you know, silvers, and you, as I said, you'll get the carp out on this sort of tackle anyway, no problem at all. Just consider that, three pound leap real line. I was beginning to think that we'd done something wrong, but because we'd, we'd had a few small roach and the peg had gone slightly quiet, but the last two fish have actually been skimmers because even, they're not big fish, they're beautiful fish, but they're not massive. Even those will actually spook the small fish out of the swim. And Understanding that when you're fishing is quite important because all of a sudden, oh yeah, it's gone, I need to change what I'm doing. Sometimes you've got to be a little bit patient, especially in colder uh, colder times of year, because it might be that just a different species of fish have moved in or bigger fish have moved in, because even the same species of fish, but bigger, bigger size fish, will bully the younger compadres out of the way. So that's a really interesting point that I'm thinking, hmm, what's happened? Nothing. 
just the skimmers have, have turned up and now that's why we like to fish with a bit of line on the bottom to give ourselves a chance that if the bait has got to the bottom and settled it's still presenting to fish that want to pick off the bottom unlike those smaller roach which are intercepting it and taking it on the way down um, you've got to anticipate that as I mentioned earlier different fish feed at different levels at different times in different places in your swim and it's also the reason why because you might have been asking yourself why I'm feeding so heavily well I believe that when there's a lot of small fish in a venue as there is in most venues especially a bit like a maggie that everything will eat you've got to kind of feed to waste and what I mean by that is that you've got to put enough bait in to feed off the fish that you don't want to catch and keep them entertained while allowing bait to fall through the peg possibly onto the bottom so that there's enough bait down there to maintain fish like skimmers and um, it's a bit of a trial and error sometimes you don't need to feed a lot if you're fishing for carp or there's only an odd fish there and you're trying to select oh, what a fast bite that I missed um, you might not feed have to feed tons but if fish are clearly feeding like they are today we're getting bites you've got to uh, feed all the mouths don't be shy of experimenting because it's all right me sat here telling you you're you know you're sat watching this video um yeah you need to do this you need to do that because every single fishing day is different and every situation is different you know we might come here in a three weeks time and the weather might be warmer colour might have dropped out of it and there might be twice as many fish feeding I might need to feed even more aggressively or you might come when it's gone really clear and another missed bite so isn't that interesting we caught them two skimmers and I think these fish are probably small roach and is that what's moved back into a swim so let's just let's just find out and, and as I didn't change anything when I stopped getting bites I'm not going to change anything immediately to go into a little bit more detail about this waggler rig I just want to show you and talk you through from the top right down to the hook so the first thing I did I took this three pound main line and I've threaded on a couple of rubber stoppers now these are the ones that are threaded onto a pre-threaded wire slide them up onto the line and the reason I use these is because sorry the reason I use two is because that gives me a good strong stiff and it doesn't move way of locking that shot it's a pre-loaded float so it's as we spoke about before tungsten ins uh, insert loading in the bottom which means I don't need too many shots it keeps it nice and neat I then slid on another couple of uh, rubber stoppers and that is basically the locking of the float now you'll see underneath that I've actually got five number eight shots now when I set this rig up that is basically the shotting for the float and that allows me a little bit of uh, movement and variance and adjustability in the rig because if I need to slide some of those shots further down to make my bait sink faster I can do but what I've actually got beneath that are two number 10 shots now we're using a very very thin insert waggler you need to use a waggler that you can see but you need to use one that's as sensitive as you possibly get it and because that's such a nice sensitive float that allows me to be able to read number 10 shots that I've got placed there and I've done them equidistant it's not very deep on this lake um, so that should give me a nice slow fall because we're loose feeding maggots and we want to replicate that when we cast our waggler in as the hook falls like that we're hoping that we're going to try and replicate the loose fed maggots and the hook is going to do the same thing now just beneath that shot to push that shot down to my knot you'll be able to see that I've actually got a loop to loop method so I've tied a loop in the main line and if you look at that you'll see that they're quite big loops and I do that on purpose the reason why I always use big loops on a, a, a waggler or any kind of running line rig is because I believe a long loop lays flatter and it uh, prevents spin-ups and tangles if you've got the nice beautiful short loops that you can tie in a pole rig uh, with a loop tying mechanism that keeps them open and which is great for using but I don't think they lay flat and that can create spin when you're retrieving your, your line 
some people also would like to use a, a big loop because they can actually see it. So if you're a guy that maybe hasn't got the dexterity that he needs or the eyesight, don't be worried about tying a big loop. It's not a problem. It probably enhanced your fishing. So looped onto that main line is a 10 inch hook length. Now I use 10 inch because that's in my opinion long enough to stop spin ups. If you use a short hook length they do spin up a little bit but it's short enough so that the shot, bottom shot, isn't too far away from the hook. That's a diameter 10 hook length and tied to that I've got an 18 B510. And that's a lovely balanced waggler rig for fishing through the water or on the drop, it's called many different things. And what we've got is the versatility, as I said, with the shots that are around the bottom of the float that I've pushed up nice and tight up to the stoppers so they don't waggle around when I'm casting. And they don't um, interfere with the flight of the float, but they are on the bottom side to aid casting. I can bring them down if I want to alter the speed of which my maggot falls through the water. Dead simple, dead easy and versatile. So let's talk about floats. Now, floats come in many, many different guises. These are wagglers, and a waggler means it's attached at the bottom, and the nature of it is that it will waggle around on the line, and that's why they're called wagglers. So we'll just try and simplify it today, and just talk about this particular type of float. We're fishing on a still water, and therefore this is probably the most suitable float, because the line is at the bottom, therefore the line sinks underneath the surface. That allows fishing presentation uh, to be a lot easier, and the float does the work for you. Now, to quickly run through the types of floats, because if you're walking into a tackle shop and you see all these different variants, you're probably going to start getting confused. Why are they different? What do they do? So here's a simple um, ABC on them. This one is a bodied waggler, named because it has this large bulbous body on the bottom. That's designed for one reason, one reason only. It carries extra weight. So if you want to cast further, or you need to have more weights down your line and not just around the float, this will give it the buoyancy that it needs to carry uh, that extra weight. Because you can see from above the body, it's no different to the others really. The next float is a straight waggler, named because it literally is that. It's the same diameter at the bottom as it is at the top. Therefore, it's a straight waggler. Thicker top, so you'll see more visible. Now, that's all about the buoyancy of the tip. And buoyancy is something you'll hear me keep repeating and talking about while we're talking about floats because the buoyancy in the tip serves uh, the purpose that you need um, if you want to fish different ways. So this one will carry more uh, weights, so if you're using shots, that'll carry more shots to sink the float. Also, if you want to use that to drag line on the bottom, because if you want to fish on the bottom and you get some uh, drift from either wind or tow, That'll counteract that. So that's a perfect float for fishing on rivers. Some people like to use them because they can see them. The rule of thumb is that you should always fish with the thinnest float at the tip that you can see. Don't try and fish with a float that you can't see because if you can't see, you'll not be able to fish. You'll not see the bites and you'll not be able to read the float. So it's very important that you choose a tip to suit you. But these are just rules of thumb and use as a guideline. Next there is what is called an insert waggler. And it's called that because it's straight for 90% 90, 90 of its length. And then at the top, it's got a thinner insert. Now, sometimes you get inserts that are thick and sometimes you get them that are really thin. This is probably quite a thin insert for a waggler. But because of the nature of these particular floats, which are plastic, it's a hollow tip and you can still see that. Despite its diameter, you can still see that because the light will pass through it. These are solid. These are all peacock wagglers. This is a crystal waggler from Drennan. Brilliant float. And then the reason I've got this one on the end is because this is different to all three of those in the fact that at the bottom there's no loading. The other three have already got the weight in them. So you can see that that's, it's got a little piece of uh, tungsten on the bottom of there and that basically allows you to just pick a float up and it will sink. If I cast, put that into the water now, it'll sink to about there, which means then you only need a few shots to either lock the float onto the line or you need a few shots to sink your rig so it'll go down. So depending on what you want to do, depends whether you want to use a loaded float, which are, in my opinion, a lot easier, or if you want to use an un unloaded float because you want to put uh, an amount of shot around the float and then more down the line, 
that will be the choice for you. You can always tell whether a float is loaded or not, so if you're in the tackle shop and you're trying to work it out and you can't see that it's obvious, is a little balance test like that. So I'm just going to lay that on my fingers and you'll see that the weight, if I just pull that, that's probably going to fall on the float because the weight is tipping it over. Whereas this float, you'll see, has gone the other way. And that's a perfect, actually I couldn't have done that better because that gives you the, the um, the feeling that that float weighs the same at both ends whereas this one's heavy at the bottom so that's got loading in it and this one doesn't because it doesn't balance okay so you can see that look that one won't do the same that one will always fall off perfect little tip just to help you to choose the right float for your day's fishing I mean I can't think of anything nicer and it's not just watching the float go under but beauty about using a float rod is you it's soft and you get to feel the fish, especially when you're catching nice quality silverfish like that skimmer. I mean, that's an absolute beauty. So, I mean, look at that, a gorgeous fish. So it is a great way to catch skimmers and other fish like that, but you might think that that's feeder fishing and that's how you want to catch them. So if you do and you want to learn a little bit more, why don't you watch one of our other videos like this one here and you can learn even more.